Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's edition of Sync Stories. I'm here with Ian Penman, a member of Sync Tank's Board of Directors and founder of New Media Law. Ian, how are you? Uh, hi, Mike. I'm, I'm great. Thanks. Thanks for asking. How are you doing? Doing well. Uh, and thanks uh, for joining us today to discuss a little bit about the laws of sync. Uh, you're definitely an expert, and uh, we're really excited to hear what you have to say about it. That's kind. Um, <laughs> great. So, yeah, just to give you a little bit of background about us, I'm also here with uh, Sam Saleh, uh, one of the lawyers at New Media Law. Um, so there's two of us online to help um, answer your questions if you have any. Um, Hi, everyone. Just, uh, I think you can hear Sam there. Um, just by way of background, I'm um, one of the founding partners of New Media Law in London. We're here in uh, the West End of London at the moment. Um, and we've been uh, running this firm for about 15 years, and we have a specialist area in, in copyright, all areas of copyright, so it's not just music, but between the lawyers here, we handle a lot of different areas of copyright law and publishing books and uh, software, uh, music, film, TV, the whole shebang. But um, today we've been asked to focus on um, the law of think and to try to help you guys understand uh, how copyright law uh, approaches the sync rights. And I'm very happy, we'll, we'll take you through a, our presentation in a moment, um, but we're very happy to take questions if you want to type in a question, um, uh, anything that, that comes out of the, of the seminar uh, as we go through it, or um, indeed if you have any que burning questions on, on copyright or sync that come to mind, then just type them in and uh, you know, we'll try and break from uh, what, we're, what we're presenting and, and try and answer your questions. But to get started, um, so if you have had a chance to look at the slides we've, we've sent through, um, you'll see we've titled this The Law of Sync, Publishing, Recording, Synchronization, and Mechanical Rights. It's a bit of a wordy title, but it does really summarize um, what we're going to look at today. Um, Starting uh, with the first slide, which is the basics of it, is we, we talk about copyright. Um, this is the, 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 the area of the law which underpins the industry that you find yourselves in if you're making music for television, film, or advertising. Um, you know, what is it? It's, it's, it's a right which, uh, which, which um, gives you the right to your creative work and, and to prevent others from using it without your consent and without you um, being paid properly. So it's, it, pretend, it, it protects you from other people copying your works. Um, we're going to look today at the different types of musical copyright and the key ones that, that we want to focus on uh, we'll get to in a minute, but they're the, the, the underlying work. Some people will call it the song, the composition, um, but in, in law, we quite often refer to it as the underlying work. And then, of course, once that, that underlying work is recorded in some way, it uh, turns into um, uh, usually a sound recording, sometimes referred to as a master or a master recording. And that's a second copyright, a separate copyright. Um, and uh, they arise when, when the work stops being just an idea in your mind, but when it, it is somehow recorded either on paper in the old days before recording equipment, people would just write down a song, a composition would be written on paper, and that's when the copyright arises. Or, of course, nowadays you tend to stick it onto a, an apple or whatever and, uh, and, and record it in some ways. And um, it, as I say, you know, once that copyright comes into existence, then it, uh, it helps you to protect your work, and, and the copyright owner is allowed some exclusivity. And it, it's pretty crucial, because without that copyright, you, you don't have anything to sell in music. So um, moving on to the second slide, um, what is it? It's a property right. It's one of several intellectual property rights, but it's a property right which you know, can be owned and inherited in the same way that you can own a house. Um, and, and there's some similarities which we can talk about as to the difference between owning a house, like owning the copyright, and renting a house, which is kind of like licensing a copyright. So there's a little analogy there in house ownership. But it's an intellectual property right. Um, it indicates the ownership and authorship 
of the uh, creative work and it's pretty much protected throughout the world so um, but there are different copyright laws in each country but uh, but nevertheless there are treaties which allow certain areas of, of the copyright law to be generally accepted across the world um, now should I should give you a little bit of a warning here we're London lawyers so we usually talk about um, English law uh, but of course there's great similarities between what happens in the rest of Europe and indeed in the States but um, in the UK the copyright arises automatically when the work is created and uh, and is written down or recorded in some way there's no formal application or registered uh, registration process in the UK so that that differs from how things would work in in America where quite often uh, the works will be registered and it's totally different to how patents and trademarks are protected. Um, important thing, people often ask me, you know, if I sing my song in public, does that mean I've lost it? You know, when, you, uh, when you're performing a song um, and you're presenting it, there's no copyright in an idea, and the idea that's presented uh, doesn't necessarily create a copyright. It's when that song is, is uh, recorded in some way and when it's put on... on uh, uh, into some recorded process that's when the idea becomes a copyright so most of the music you'll deal with in in the in the sync sector um, will have copyright protection so that's the basics of copyright how many musical copyrights are this so we're moving on to the next slide and um, yeah, here we're talking about the publishing rights which I've mentioned the musical composition but they also include the lyrics it's crucial to remember that the person who writes the lyrics is creating a separate copyright work and um, usually that is divided on a sort of 50-50 basis with the melody um, stroke chord sequence but um, that's the publishing rights that we refer to quite often people talk about publishing rights that's what they are they're the musical composition rights and the lyric rights are the, can I ask you a question I'm oh, sorry Ian. sure uh, just so when, when is it do you see often that the musical composition and lyrics will be split and the copyrights will be licensed or handled separately? Is that and does that happen? And if so, is it can you describe yeah, the process? It's, it's possible. It's the answer to that, Mike, is it's entirely possible that, that you can have um you know, the the most famous example I guess in the UK, I don't know if everyone's heard of an artist called uh, Elton John. Um, <laughs> but Elton John doesn't write his lyrics, you know, he has um a, a lyricist um, who uh, called Bernie Torpin, and Bernie writes those great lyrics uh, that you catch on on the, on the Elton John songs. And generally, all the lyrics are written by Bernie, and all, all of the uh, music is written by Elton John. So you know they're different copyrights, and they're owned by different people. But you can agree, you know, between you, if you're co-writing a song and you're in the room at the same time, you can say, well, why don't we split this 50-50? Uh, you might do most of the lyrics, I might do most of the music, but you know, um, why don't we agree to do this on a 50-50 basis? An American example would be Bacharach and David, you know, where again, how David predominantly writing all the lyrics and, and Bacharach writing the music, but you can, you can register that song, the overall song, musical composition and the lyrics as a copyright work and say, you know, it's Bacharach and David and we'll split it 50-50 and most of the time that's what happens is, is you kind of incorporate the lyrics into the uh, the registered work um, and then you decide between you how the, the splits would go and, and you, you know obviously it's going to be uh, basically down to who does the work but you could agree you know uh, the, the most famous example I refer to on, on joint copyright ownership is Lennon and McCartney you know Lennon and McCartney it's pretty obvious some of the songs were not written by McCartney they were written by Lennon and it's pretty obvious vice versa but they took the view early on you know what so that we 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 don't have a fight over how many of your tunes go on the album, how many of my tunes go on the album. Why don't we just call everything Lennon McCartney? Um, and of course, to jump in there as well is, um, as we've seen a lot of the music moving away from the uh, recording recording studios and gone into the bedrooms where people set up their own studios, it's becoming more common that there will be people who have different rights that they own in the different parts of of whatever is created, whether it be the lyrics or the compositions. Cool. So that so it, it seems. To, yeah. I'm sorry. Continue. Yeah. No. So you have a question, Mike. Sure. 
Uh, so it seems to just really exist on a case by case basis, and that's kind of always con- decided uh, between the two parties. Um, how, how do you? I, I know this is maybe borderlining, and I'm not offering legal advice, but um, are there best practices for negotiating those things, um, or any tips that that you know seem to keep people out of any sort of future issue with defi- uh, deciding you know who participates in what ownership of copyrights? Or any, you know, yeah, resources. For sure. the, yeah, for sure. The best practice is agree between you walk in the between you before you walk in the room. Who, you know, how are we going to treat this? If we, if we create something together here, how are we going to how are we going to treat this? It, you know, but as I say, usually it, it's quite obvious because one person handles a particular type of the work. So you know, one person writes the lyrics. Um, or one person writes the music, or indeed, you know, uh, someone who's uh, perfectly capable of writing and, and uh, their own lyrics and making their own song will, will take both. But the best practice is to agree either before you walk in the room, how are we going to treat this, or immediately that you finish the song, say, hey, you know, this that was great, thanks for helping me with that, and what are we, how are we going to treat this? Are we, we going to treat this as a, as a joint composition, uh, 50-50? But ideally, you know, you kind of get a shake hands agreement immediately before or immediately after the song is created. But most professional writers will go into a writing session and say, right, you know, okay, I'm with you today. Let's see what we come up with. And, you know, whatever we, whatever we do today, we'll treat it 50-50. You know, it's it's un- unusual for two professional songwriters to go into a room and, and then uh, agree a split other than 50-50. It would have to be something really dramatic that's gone on where, for example, they've tried to write a song between them and it hasn't really happened, and one of the guys has said, you know, look, I've got this, this composition I've been working on for a while. It's almost finished. Maybe you can help me finish it. Um, but, you know, you generally have to, you know, uh, uh, try and evaluate, well, who's done what here? You know, what, what, how do we... Um, how do we decide the workload and uh, and uh, and try to come up with a uh, a result which reflects the workload? Uh, certainly, you know, if one of the band, if you take a group of members of a band, if you know four of them are in a bar drinking and one of them is slaving away over a hot piano trying to write the songs, he's going to be pretty angry if they say we want it all to be equal splits because it isn't. He's doing the work. Um, does, does that help you? Does that give you a, a bit of an answer there? Oh yes, very much. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So moving through it, so then uh, we, we we'll talk about the sort of who wrote what. We can get into that a little bit more later. But then we look at the other rights apart from the composition lyrics, the publishing rights. We're looking at the sound recording rights. So um, usually this is, the, of course, the copyright in the recording, and that's the recording which captures that composition. And by and large, um, you know, record companies pick this right up. They they make the arrangements, the studios, they book the studios, they pay for the studios. And of course, if they've got an artist signed to a, a label deal, then they're going to have um, exclusive assignment of, of copyright in the recordings that that artist makes. Um, so that's the sound recording, which is a separate copyright. And you know, when you're dealing with sync in a, a, a movie, you're going to make sure that you've got the composition rights and the sound recording right. Never forget that. If you have only one takeaway from today, remember you need both, or you don't. You haven't got the rights to to grant for synchronization. And the, um, the sound so, the sound recording rights. Sorry, the, yeah, that would just could uh, be each individual master uh, that was made off of the the actual composition and lyrics. Just to confirm, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, each one so has its own right. Of course, the song a song can be redone many, many times. You know, one of my good friends, um, father wrote uh, the song "Killing Me Softly." I'm sure you all heard of that. Um, and it's a you know a fantastic song which is covered many, many times by different artists. So each time that it's covered, then there's a separate copyright in the sound recording. It's a brand new sound recording copyright. But the original music composition and lyric rights stay with the same uh, writer. Uh, but you need both to be able to use that version on your film or TV episode or advert. But then don't forget also there's the rights in whoever performs on the sound recording. And that's a different right, the performer's right. So you do have to make sure that you catch that, that if there's someone who has performed on the, the, on the recording that maybe hasn't written the song and isn't the artist signed to the record company and therefore is not participating in the sound recording, they still have performer's rights which you need to pick up. Um, you know, normally you ca- encounter this when you know someone 
plays a blinding sax solo. You know, we can all think of Jerry Rafferty or George Michael who've had hits where people sing the sax solo before they sing the main melody. Normally, if that's a session guy, then you'll do a session form and you'll pick up his performer's rights by getting an assignment of his copyright in his rights in return for money uh, and, and then that's that covered and usually that goes to the, the record company so they capture that within the recording rights but it's an important aspect to analyze which is who's playing on this recording and am I capturing all of their rights as well and then the fourth thing we look at is the moral rights which is a slightly different right to the sound recording or compositional performers right and that looks at um, the uh, who has written it, who's written the song, who's written uh, the lyrics and you look at the key rights of the moral rights of the paternity right which is the right of that person to be identified as the author uh, of the work. Sorry I've just noticed there's a typo in the slide there that should say author where it says other which is on point four my mistake sorry about that but yeah the right to be identified as the author of the work and the integrity right which is the right to object to a derogatory treatment so if someone does a terrible version of your song which is so awful or so bad um, that they that you really hate it then you might want to object and say this is damaging me this is such a bad version of my song that I can't allow it um, and you've got to be careful on the moral rights um, when you're dealing with advertising because it may be a product which the author doesn't approve of so the composer says you know what I don't care what you say I don't want my music being linked to you know such and such product it may be I don't know cigarettes or whatever it might be so you know at the end of the day you've got to be careful there rights got to sweep those in as well um, and we've got a slide there on how do the cop how do copyright and moral rights differ um, and it just needs to point out to you that the the uh, the economic uh, rights are usually under copyright the moral rights are more concerned with protecting the personality and reputation of the composer the person who's written this um, and in the UK we have a, an issue where you you have to be um, assert your moral rights you have to actually make an assertion that you want them to be uh, recognized and if if you uh, don't do that then it's um, you you're, you're not going to be able to rely on the moral rights and equally you can waive them and quite often you'll see this in a it, when someone um, uh, is uh, recording a, a sound recording for a record company that there'll be a waiver of moral rights to make sure that um, that, that that artist later doesn't say hey you know I hate that recording it's ruined my song and I don't want you releasing it um, but you've got to be careful in countries like a, like France the, um, they take the moral rights the droit d'auteur as they call them as a very uh, powerful inalienable that you can't uh, you know uh, you can't um, waive them and then we wanted to look at uh, mechanical rights we quite often get asked um, what is a mechanical right well it's the right uh, which is held by the composer the right to make a permanent recording of that composer's piece of music so anyone who records a musical work needs permission from the owner of the publishing rights in the composition um, and normally uh, that comes uh, by way of uh, you get a royalty in return for um, providing the mechanical rights but um, of course if it's a cover version and the song's already been released you don't need permission to uh, to do a cover version of that song if it's already been released to the public but of course you all of the royalties to do with the composition side would go to the original the original owner so it's worth thinking about you know if I'm going to do a cover version of a famous song it's worth having a conversation or a discussion with the the original copyright owner or their publisher to see if they approve of a cover being recorded because you may be able to get a split of the composition rights if you don't do that then once it's released for sure uh, the, the hundred percent of the money in respect to the publishing is going to go to the original owner of the copyright in the, in the, the composition and uh, people make mistakes about that all the time a famous example in the UK would be a band called The Verve um, uh, who wrote a song called Bittersweet Symphony which was based on a 16 bar refrain from a Rolling Stones record and they didn't ask permission beforehand they just did it 
Uh, and then it turned out to be a great sounding song and they thought great and the record company loved it and they said let's release it as a single and it was a big hit record and then they realized that they don't own these rights and they went to the Stones and said hey you know we've kind of written this song based on your your 16 bar refrain and can we split the copyright and guess what the Rolling Stones said let me tell you no <laughs> how about we have a hundred percent of the of the recording uh, rights as well as the composition rights. So, you know, it, 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 because they used a sample from a Stones record and they'd then written a song around it, the Stones you know, retained 100% of sound recording and uh, uh, and composition rights. So they got nothing. The biggest hit record, they didn't get a penny. So, and that's a, that's a very thinkable, uh, I mean, a very popular and thinkable hook as well. Um, did, they, did that, do you know of, any, of that actually being licensed and then, you know, that, of course, money, all that money just going directly to the Stones or were, were, uh, were the very... I, I don't what, personally know uh, of, a, of a license of it. I'm, I'm sure it has been used um, uh, on, on film or TV or ad, but... Uh, but for sure, um, you know, they, they, anyone wanting to use that song or that recording would have to go to the Rolling Stones first and get permission, and 100% of the sync uh, monies would go to the Stones, no question. And there's, and there's nothing that uh, the, the creator of the, of the master um, without that mechanical right can do to, to bar that because they just basically made a, a track that they really, or a master that they released. The problem was they based the song around a sample, so that's where they get screwed in respect of the sound recording rights because they've used a sample of a Rolling Stones recording. It was actually a, a string refrain from an instrumental version of the song, um, which uh, the Rolling Stones' manager had put together. But nevertheless, they, they, they used that string section and they sampled it. So the sample is what nails them on the, on the, the sound recording. And then, of course, the the underlying work, the composition rights, they're nailed on that because it's, um, you know, they, they've, they basically use someone else's composition. So there, there, there's a lesson there to learn, which is if you really, really, really must use somebody else's work, A, ask them and try and cut a deal first before you record it. You know, if you go along and say, I'm thinking of using your song, but if I, you don't let me, then I might use this Pink Floyd song. Hey, they're much more likely to say yes and say, yeah, let's split the... Uh, Let's split the, uh, the, the, the royalties. Um, and then the second lesson is, OK, if, you are, if they say no and you still want to use their composition, don't use any sample from their sound recording. Because at least then you would be able to own the sound recording yourselves and keep 50% of the money. Um, so if you were to do a re-record? Yeah, just a re-record or a new version, you know, I mean. Right. You know, using the uh, the example of "Killing Me Softly," you know, if you've got two different artists record uh, the so the same song, the record royalties are not uh, you know not being divided at all. The record royalties go to the artist that recorded that master. But you know, well, the moment you grab a sample from somebody else's recording, um, then you know you're starting from the position that they are going to take all of the the royalties for that sound recording. So there's, there's two lessons to learn there. Um, so, you know, we're moving on to the slides to what are synchronization rights, the next um, slide. So what are the rights here? The film producer is going to need two sync rights. One is the right to synchronize the sound recording with the movie, and the second one is to, to the right to synchronize the underlying composition or lyrics that are in that sound recording. Um, so those are the two rights that the, uh, the, the, the producer of the film is going to need. But, you know, do flick back to the earlier slide where, you know, you've got to make sure you've captured, you know, there's a sax solo on the song, on the recording. Make sure you've captured that guy's work um, and make sure you've looked into the moral rights and, and got those waivers where necessary. And then once you get that, um, you get those rights, uh, what, what rights are protected here? Um, obviously, copying and record, copying and recording the, the music, which is the mechanical right, and then issuing and selling copies of that to the public. Um, uh, rent or lend the music to the public, perform or show or play the music in public, so that's your theatrical right, if you like, and then you've got communication broadcast, you need the right to be able to put it on TV or HBO or whatever, and the right to make an adaption. Um, so uh, adaptation. So you know, you, you of course you you're 
you may not, you probably won't use all of the song and all of the sound recording in a film. You'll be chopping it. You'll be editing it. So that's a, you know, you've got to make sure you pick that up. Um, is that you get the right to adapt, edit, chop, change both the, the composition and the sound recording. Um, otherwise, someone can say, hey, you know, I, you said you wanted to use my song. I thought you meant the whole song, not a bit of it. And um, the same with the sound recording. So that's important. That, that it's covered what the use is going to be, how much time you know you're going to put on the on the film and and how much of that song is going to be used. So why does it matter to you? Well, you know if you're a producer of film, the film producer needs to make a physical copy of the music to record it onto a soundtrack and to run it in synchronization with the filmed imagery. So the producer has to have the right to copy the music. Uh, they're going to want to sell the film. They're going to want to send it to broadcast distribution companies general public, they might want to rent it, you know, whether it's by DVD in the old days or possibly now Blinkbox, Netflix or other rental type arrangements. Um, communicating, broadcasting, showing the film to the public in cinemas or in their homes. And adaptation, as I say, to talk about chopping it, editing it, uh, all of those rights. And you have to have permission of the owner and the copyright um, to do any of that. And without that, then you're infringing their rights. And uh, why is that important? Moving on to the next slide. Well, uh, an infringer can be sued and they can be sued for damages. So if, if you don't get these rights and you put this music on a film, then uh, you, know, you can be sued for infringement of the copyright and there can be severe damages. There can be damages um, awarded and of course the cost of the lawsuit. You know, if you haven't got the right and you've put this song or recording on a film, um, then you know you've got this infringement action, and the costs of taking action are heavy, and the damages can be heavy. And in some cases, the copyright owner may even be able to prevent the exhibition of the film. They can say, you know, this this has got my music incorporated in the film. It's outrageous. The, the music's all over the film. It's a critical part of the film. I never gave permission for the synchronization rights. And they can obtain, in some extreme cases, an injunction and prevent the release of the film or prevent the advert hitting the screens. So, you know, that's pretty dramatic. Um, and then any third party that the producer in turn deals with when they're trying to market, sell, broadcast the film, like a distributor, a cinema chain, a TV broadcaster, they're going to need to know that the producer has picked up the rights, has got the necessary consent, because otherwise they're going to be in breach. So it's kind of what we call chain of title, is showing that you have got the rights that you purport to sell on. And the distributor uh, you know, of the film or the, the, the broadcaster, if it's going on TV, they're not going to broadcast um, the, or, or, or show the film in a cinema chain without checking the chain of title to make sure that all of the relevant consents and licenses have been gained. Because then they are also infringing the copyright and they can be sued. And what they would normally do is they'd go to the person who's providing the music and get um, what we call in law the warranty and uh, the warranty is backed up by an indemnity and the warranty says yeah I've got the rights to to put this to, to give you this music and let you use the music on the film and if I'm lying and I don't have the rights I'm indemnifying you for the costs and damages so you know certainly the broadcaster will insist on those clauses the warranty and the indemnity when they when they or the film distributor but the reality of it is unless they can tick the boxes with the chain of title and show that that stuff is there, that those those rights have already been acquired um, by the producer of the film, they're probably not going to take the film on. They're probably going to say, look, this is too dangerous for us. There's, we can't show that the music has been acquired properly, and we're not going to risk it. So it becomes part of that chain of title package that the, uh, that the broadcaster or distributor wants to see before they, um, before they go ahead with uh, exploiting the film. So where do you get this stuff from? Um, how do you find out who owns it? So moving on to the next slide, which we've called um, first ownership of publishing rights. So here we're looking at film music, which is commissioned, um, composed, uh, recorded specifically for this film. And um, the publishing rights belong to the author of the musical composition. So you start looking at the publishing rights. You say, OK, who wrote this composition? Who wrote the lyrics we talked about earlier? Are they going to be different people? And uh, sometimes they will be, but more likely than not, 
the people who have agreed that they are the composers will tell you, you know, Lennon and McCartney, Jagger Richards, we're the composers of this uh, song, and uh, you know, these are the people you come to um, to to collect um, uh, to, to to get that information. Uh, Mike, you wanted to see if there's any questions coming in. Should we stop for a second? Uh, yeah, you know, we had a couple of interesting questions that were um, related to a few slides back. Um, and thanks, first off, thanks for that. That was kind of one of the most comprehensive, uh, you know, in-depth looks at uh, at licensing and who, who's owning what and copyrights that we've ever had on this uh, on this webinar. So thank you for that. Um, you know, you. Mick. Oh, great, excellent. So, um, so Mick Rose asks. Um, so if, if he creates a, a cover song uh, and releases it on SoundCloud, he, do, he doesn't need licenses. He won't participate in any of the um, information. Or I'm not sorry, any of, any of the licensing or any of the ownership or, or you know, exploitation of that copyright, but he won't, um, he won't be uh, in possible trouble for releasing that. Is that is, he just wanted to clarify that point. So let me understand I've got the question right. So someone has, has done a cover version of somebody else's song? Yeah, so if, if Mick covered uh, someone's song and then releases it on uh, SoundCloud, um, you know, with his own recording, uh, does he need licenses for that? Does right. he need to license? The answer to that is no, um, but you've got to be careful, of course, in terms of what exploitation is being made of the music. It certainly, if there's payment coming in for the exploitation of that new sound recording, then whoever owns the original song is going to say, I'm, I would expect to collect the publishing royalties. Now, there's one exception to me saying you don't need those permissions. And this is if the song has never been released to the public anywhere else. Right? The law allows the, the creator of the song to, to control the first time it's released to the public. So, it, so the example here would be you've heard a song which has never been released or someone's played you a song that has never been released and you think, hey, I'm going to do a cover version of that and I'm going to get it up on SoundCloud. They could certainly prevent that happening if that song has never been released to the public in the past. Even if it's a cover, it doesn't matter. Um, but of course, usually, you know, your first exposure to the song that you like that you want to do a cover of and put on SoundCloud, you've heard it somewhere else. So usually it's been released somewhere else. Once it's been released to the public somewhere else, you can do your cover version of it. But of course, using the example of the Verve, the, the, the guys who wrote the song are still going to get 100% of the publishing royalties. Now, where this blows up is if you're collecting money and you're not giving the publishing royalties to the original owners, then, then that's when it becomes problematic. But SoundCloud, as I understand it, you, you, you wouldn't be exploiting it for commercial gain, so you'll probably... You know, you're really cool. Thanks for that. Um, and then Samuel Jacobs asked the question, uh, how, how do copyrights affect royalties? Um, I think that maybe um, it's kind of a broad question, but um, have you... Within the types of royalties that you've seen, um, you know, people getting paid, whether they be performers uh, or royalties from, um, you know, actual the actual copyright or masterwork, um, is there some sort of direct correlation to the copyrights um, affecting royalties of, say, individual performers uh, on, on a master or something like that, depending on who owns the, the, the publishing? Is there any kind of interaction between the royalties and the different types of copyrights? Um, uh, so let me understand this. This is talking about um, the different writers and then the people who are making the recordings. And is there inter is there an interaction between the royalties? Is that the question? Yeah, more or less. That's what I'm getting from it. Um, well, in in synchronization, which is after all the focus of our discussion today, usually you work along the lines. It start with of, of fifty percent of the money goes to the sound recording, and fifty percent of the money goes to the the, the the song. Now that's not always the case, and it's certainly negotiable. And a publisher might say, you know, I'll let you sync that to your film for twenty thousand dollars, and the recording company say, no way, you know, you're not having my master unless you pay us $100,000. So it's a negotiation, but, you know, you start from the premise that, you know, you're going to need both rights and let's value both rights the same. Now, how does that money get split up? Um, it just comes down to, right, let's say in the example I give that you say 50% of the sync 
um, exploitation fee is going to go to the, the, the song copyright owner, um, well, obviously, it's usually collected by a publisher. Uh, if, if, the, if those writers have a publisher, that, that publisher's job is to collect that cash and then take their share for adminning it and then pass the royalties to the writers. And the, the, the royalty splits, which we mentioned earlier, um, will be divided in the, in the way that the, the writers have de decided. So going back to Bernie Torpin, Elton John, Candle in the Wind, you know, they've agreed to split that 50-50. It's 50% my lyric, 50% your music. So that side of it, the publishing side of it, you pay for the sync rights, the publisher collects the money, they take their share under the publishing contract, and then they'll divide up the royalty between um, the, the two writers who wrote the lyrics and the music. And so that division, is what we call the royalty splits, is, um, is decided by the writers between them. And of course, sometimes there are fights over it. You know, it can be long, ongoing fights over it. But hopefully, as I say, you know, the rule of thumb, you try to agree between you in a sensible fashion who did what and what the splits are going to be. And of course, you know, if you've got four writers of a song, uh, like you 2 quite often uh, treat their songs as being written by all of the members of the band, then it's a 25% split. Uh, so if, if then you look at the. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. Sorry. I was just going to say, then you look at the other side of it, which is the sound recording, and the same thing applies. So in my example, I talk about 50% of the money going to the sound recording owner. Well, usually the record company collects that. If, the, if there's a, a proper record company involved, they'll, they'll be collecting the cash. They'll take their share, whatever that might be, um, whatever's agreed in the record contract, and then they split the rest between the artists. And again, it's usually how many artists perform on the record. So if you're in a band of five musicians, it's usually split five ways. Excellent, and that and um, any license will uh, incur performance. I know this is a little outside of the scope, but any any uh, license and sub and subsequent. Uh, is, is, uh, I guess it, okay. Let me put it this way: if you license if you license a track um, to a movie and there are art, there are performers on it and they're collecting performance rights, which is a different thing. Um, do they somehow participate in in that license because of their uh, right on the master or performance right on the master? Well, as I say, normally the performance right is captured by the record company. If this if this track is signed by a major record company or even an indie record company, normally the, the record company is very astute at picking up the rights of everyone uh, involved with that recording. So you know they're they're not going to miss who played on this record, and let's make sure we've got all the relevant rights. And um, you know, it'd be very unusual for a record company to not pick up the performance rights of a, a, a sax player or a, someone playing, a, you know, I don't know, bongos or congas or some slightly unusual instrument which ends up being on that, that recording. You know, the, the record company's job is to pick up the, the, the rights in that performance and make sure they're all swept in to the sound recording copyright. So usually the record company owns the sound recording copyright and they've swept up all the various bits and pieces that might be other performers' rights if there's a bunch of different people performing. Because otherwise, you'd have a guy, you know, waving a red flag at some point saying, hey, you know, like, I played tambourine on such and such major hit. You can't show that you've picked up my rights. I'm blocking the use of the song because of my tambourine part. I mean, you know, realistically, would a judge allow him to injunct a movie because he said he played tambourine on a recording and, and, and he hasn't uh, signed his rights? No, you know, no sensible judge is going to injunct a movie based on that. But right. what the judge might do is say, you know, well, you've got to keep sort this guy out. He says he played tambourine on that recording. You want to use that recording on your film. You've got to make him happy, give him a royalty, and pay him some money. So that's normally how it happens. But usually the performers are swept in to the record company copyright, and the record company says, you know, I own all rights in the sound recording, that's it, you get the sound recording rights from me, and if I tell you I've got the sound recording rights, I'm telling the truth, and if I'm lying, don't worry, I'm indemnifying you for a problem. Right. Excellent. Well, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I have a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Um, so Felicia Roberts, uh, oh great. So Felicia Roberts writes, uh, with regard to sync licensing in the UK, uh, can you explain the PRS license that includes graphic rights? Uh, and is there something similar in the U.S.? Sorry, I didn't catch that. The PRS license that includes? Um, she, she wants a little explanation on the PRS license, uh, including information on the graphic right. 
and then any similar, uh, yeah. Graphic, right. So are, are we referring here to the right to, to uh, portray the lyrics? I mean, what do you mean by graphic? Uh, let's see. Uh, Felicia, could you write in? I'd imagine that w that's what you're uh, referring to, but we just want to make sure. Uh, she says, yep, that's correct. So that is correct. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, so I'm presuming here you're talking about the kind of thing that might end up on YouTube where you see the lyrics um, being uh, portrayed. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, the uh, the lyrics are part of the copyright and the underlying work. And um, certainly, if you if you want to use the lyrics in a graphic manner, then you probably would would make that clear in the, the context of the license. But most licenses, whether PRS or anyone else, will will give you the right to use that underlying work in your in your um, in your uh, uh, audio visual work, whether it's film or whatever. But uh, it's probably worth being specific just to make sure. That uh, that the composer is happy with the lyrics being shown in a graphic manner, but but in theory, once you get the license to use the song, you know most times you would that license would be drafted in such a way that it would include the graphic rights. You know, certainly, I, I would I would I would draft it so I, as the film producer, am buying the right to use your composition in the film. But the you know the and, and with the adaptation rights to edit and chop it and you know I only want to use thirty seconds or whatever it might be, so you know the 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 wording of the sync license should be wide enough to give the film producer the film director sufficient scope to do what they want to do, but certainly it's quite unusual to want to print lyrics to 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 have a graphic of the lyrics. So if you are going to do that, then I would I would probably make that explicit. In the sync license, you know, the, the legal wording would say something like "including, but not limited to, the right to uh, display the lyrics of the composition graphically on the film." Just to make it absolutely clear, that's part of what I'm buying here. Does that help? It helps me for sure. <laughs> um, so another just quick question regarding the SoundCloud. And I don't part. think that would be any different. Just to finally one point on that is, you know, uh, in terms of how the PRS deal with it or how BMI or ASCAP deal with it. I, I, you know, I haven't got any ASCAP licenses or BMI licenses in front of me, but that would be, you know, if I'm if I'm making the movie and I want to put uh, the graphic uh, graphics of the lyrics up in the movie, then I would check the wording. Of the specific BMI or ASCAP license, if you're getting it via one of the collection societies, and just check that and make sure it covers what I want to do. If it doesn't, then I would either go back to BMI or ASCAP, or, or ASCAP, or I would go to the publisher, the individual publisher. And we're gonna, as we go through these slides, I'm gonna take you through a bit more detail on on how to, you know, where to go to look for for to get this, these consents. Okay, great. Um, so just, I'm going to paraphrase here, uh, just back to the SoundCloud uh, question of being able to post uh, cover songs on SoundCloud without permission. Um, is, is there any concern about uh, that being considered a public performance? And if so, does that have any, uh, could that possibly have any legal ramifications for the person who recorded and posted it? Um, I, I think the answer is yes, it, there could be. It, it depends on, you know, uh, uh, it, here's the issue. If you if you take someone to court for copyright infringement, and people very rarely do, let me tell you, I get people coming into the office all the time with problems wanting to sue people over copyright infringement, and normally when I tell them we're going to need twenty or £30,000 on account to start the action, they normally change their minds, right? So there's not that many copyright infringement lawsuits go as far as, as a real suit which ends up at trial and the, the, with SoundCloud you know uh, as I understand I'm not sure how you would make money how is that if you put that cover version up on SoundCloud maybe someone ex can explain it to me you know how are you actually receiving money for that and if, if you were receiving money for it then of course the owner of the composition is going to want their share but you know are they going to sue you for putting a, a track up on SoundCloud that isn't generating any income what would be their damages what, what have they lost? So I think, you know, I, I've never heard of anyone suing anyone for putting a song up on, on SoundCloud, that, that, you know, under those circumstances, because there's no damages. You, you can't see any damage. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Okay, well, thanks for uh, taking the time to answer those questions. Let's, uh, let's roll on with the slides, and then we'll, we'll um, you know, 
field yeah, questions. Sure. There. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scoot through a few of the slides here. So we were looking at second ownership. So the first ownership in publishing, obviously the person who writes the song, the lyricist, the musician that, that composes it. Second ownership, normally those composers assign their rights to a music publishing company, so that's where you look next to find out where you get these permissions. And usually the composer has not retained rights of ownership. They've, they've actually passed the copyright on to the publisher. So you then go to the publishing company. Um, why does a composer do this? Moving on to the next slide. Um, the composer assigns it primarily for money. You know, obviously they want to get, uh, they want to make sure that they get a, a, an upfront fee in most cases, and they want to make sure somebody is collecting the royalties. So the publisher is going to manage their portfolio of songs, exploit it. It's not a creative job. It's an admin and commercial business. And um, they are going to basically uh, then admin and collect the monies and, 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 and relieves the composers of the business side, and allows them to focus on the creative side. And a major publishing company would be better able to sell and market the songs internationally than an individual composer. So in theory, if you've got a good publishing company, they're pushing your work. They're trying to find syncs for you. They're trying to get things done. And and um, and and you know, of course, if they if it's a hit record, then you know, the, then people come to them to look for the right to use that that song, and they're not not dealing with the individual writer. So then the next ownership you look at is uh, the collection societies, this third one. What does the collection society do? Well, it issues licenses to anyone who wishes to make a particular use of a piece of music. So film broadcasted over radio, using an advert. Quite often you will, you'll see the collection societies will, will be um, issuing blanket licenses, and they collect the revenue from those uses. And why do we need collection societies? Well, we could have a whole other seminar, and maybe we will, on whether you should put your rights, your digital rights, take them out of a collection society and look after them yourself. There's a strong argument for that. You've probably heard of uh, Cobalt. You know, one of the things that one of our consultants, Rick Riccobono, advised was that Cobalt by Amra, now Cobalt owns its own collection society, so they can do a digital license worldwide. One place, one stop shop. All of Spotify paid to Amra. You collect all the one company collects all the money. Fantastic way forward. Much better re reporting. Much better uh, collection of money than using lots of collection societies worldwide. Each one of which is taking a piece of your pie. But you do still need collection societies because every bar in New York, every bar in London is playing music. You know who's going to go and knock on the door of that bar and and collect uh, money where it's uh, where it's um, where it's due to be paid certainly in England um, you know every bar in, in in England that's playing music has to pay for a PRS license and a PPL license so you know a, a pub in England is paying money for the, to the for the publishing rights and the sound recording rights and without both of those licenses it's illegal to play music to the public but so we do need collection societies and there'll always be a need for them unless you want to go around every bar in uh, in Birmingham and pick up the cash yourself, which no one has the time to do. Um, the example I've given in the slides is the PRS, because of course we know much more about the UK societies. Um, you know, they collect uh, license fees for public performance, broadcast and musical works, um, and then also the, what used to be the MCPS is now kind of swept in to the PRS. It's now PRS for Music, which includes the old MCPS the Mechanical Copyright Collection Society, so they're collecting and distributing mechanical royalties which come in to, from the, the recording of the music. Um, why does a publishing company use the Collection Society? It's just cheaper and more efficient for the publishing company to outsource these admin tasks, but some companies will still manage the, the, the stuff themselves. So beware, um, you know, the Collection Societies don't always have all of the rights that they, you think they might. You have to double check, <coughs> and excuse me, and you have to ask them with this particular work that I want to use. Can you grant me a license, or do I need to go to the publisher, or indeed to the individual uh, writer? So on the next slide, we said, how do you know who to deal with? So you know, um, the producer will find a composer if he wants some music. So they'll normally start with the composer. And they'll ask the composer if they have a publishing contract, um, and deal with the publisher. And they'll ask the publishing company if they've assigned or licensed any relevant rights to a collection society. Um, and then they'll go through those steps to make sure that you're getting the right rights for the film or TV. 
um, what contracts are needed um, if the pub if the composer has no publishing company relationship the producer wants an assignment of the copyright so this is what we call the buyout uh, the work for hire under US law so you know the, 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 if, there's, if the composer doesn't have a publishing company relationship the film producer will say you know I want to buy out please you know I'm gonna pay you a certain amount of money you compose music for the film and I own all rights it's all mine and it's a buyout it's a one-off fee there's no royalty uh, but in the case of a famous composer or a composer of a famous tune they're not going to assign those rights they, you know uh, it may be because they don't want to or they've already assigned them to a big publishing company so the producer then is not going to get an assignment because they've already been assigned to a publisher and the publisher won't give that assignment they're going to get a license instead and the license then is going to be a mechanical license to put the music and uh, to synchronize it and the composition to the film so a mechanical license to record it and a sync license to put it into the film and that can those those licenses will often be in one agreement but you're going to need that agreement um, so going back to our earlier analogy uh, someone who's being asked to write songs from for, for a movie and doesn't have a publishing relationship they may well sell the house they may just say yep you pay me money you buy the house if it's a famous composer or composition rights in a famous song or a song that's been released is already published then you're going to probably end up with a rental like a license so renting the room for a period of time using that analogy um, and then of course if the composer also performs on the sound recording then you know the film producer is going to need to pick up the consent to use that performance as well so you've always got to have these things in mind not only who wrote the song not only who, who wrote the lyrics but who is the artist that's recording it and who is performing on that sound recording make sure that um, you're sweeping up all of the relevant rights if you're a film uh, producer moving on to then recording rights um, the first um, ownership starts with um, uh, the, the, the person that makes the arrangements for the sound recordings to take place usually artist that records it um, if it's met from their budget and of course the record company will usually make the arrangements and they'll usually make sure that they sweep up the rights into their record contract and that they pick up the, the, the rights in the sound recording um, but you know you've got to be careful if the producer of the record which is you know can be uh, someone who's making the record pays the composer a sum of money um, uh, and uh, as part of the fee to organize arrange and produce the, the recording sessions then it may be the producer um, is the party who made the relevant arrangement and so um, the producer or uh, may end up um, owning uh, copyrights so you've just got to be careful there uh, going through that as to, to who is actually creating that sound recording and make sure you've got the relevant assignments um, to pull that in once that recording comes into place the second ownership um, uh, usually is you look at the recording contract and uh, of course a known composer or main artist will usually have an exclusive recording contract with a record company and that means they can only record for that company they can't go down the road and record another version of their song for somebody else so usually then you've got the record company that owns the copyright in that sound recording um, you know the advantages to the to the uh, to the artist of course the record company will pay the recording costs put them in the studio and of course then they will spend the money marketing and distributing um, uh, the, the record and um, and the, it, it may be that you can do a deal with them on a soundtrack album you know that, that the record company will market and distribute um, a soundtrack album for you the third ownership flicking onto the next slide on the recording rights again collection societies not as common as you get with the publishing companies but some record companies do use collection societies and here I'm particularly thinking of um, PPL in, in London and certainly PPL will, will, will collect for public performance of the, uh, the sound recording um, and, uh, and that's how uh, you check that as well so w for a film producer who do they know who to deal with with recording rights they, they start with the artist or the performer they ask the composer if they have contracts with recording companies which will impact on this recording um, and then they talk to the record company to discuss the terms so 
usually the film producer or the ad producer will, will start talking with the record company if there's a record company in place um, and they'll try to get the license or assignment that they want um, and sometimes they'll go to the collection society if there's appropriate licenses that are acquired there. Um, might be a point to stop there. Uh, I know we've been on for coming up to an hour now. Are there any uh, questions on um, any of that that, that that you'd like to pick up on? Um, Verity asks a question not related to the slides. Um, she was hoping, Ian, that you could briefly discuss uh, what a sync agent needs in place, um, seeing uh, they don't own the master or the publishing uh, in order to clear a license. Sorry, I didn't that. catch that question, Mike. Can you say it again? Oh, sure. Apologies. Um, so she was just wondering if, as a sync agent, uh, what do, do would one need in place if they were trying to facilitate the license without owning the master or the publisher? So they're a sync agent, um, yes. and it sounds like me. Still the relationship. Not. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like me. Um, she's just uh, asking if you were to work as a third-party admin or agent. Um, to be facilitating sync. To me, it would just seem like a relationship um, and the ability to clear both the master and the publishing uh, for any particular license. So just being in touch with the owners of each and, and making sure that they know that you're going to be uh, looking for sync or looking for licensing for those and being able to execute it with those parties yeah. would be my understanding. Yeah, I think it's just it's another link in the chain, isn't it, really, is that... Um Obviously, um, the, there are quite a few ad agencies that, that, that uh, will go to an agent and say, you know, we're looking for a particular type of music for this particular ad, and can you make some recommendations, and can you pull the rights in for us? Um, it, from my perspective, it doesn't change anything at all in terms of the legalities, in terms of, well, who owns what, and have I got the relevant rights from the relevant rights owners? Um, uh, uh, most sync agencies that I deal with will uh, certainly be quite adept at, at knowing what rights they need and knowing where to get them and how to get them and that's part of why they get a fee you know that's part of what they're they're in the chain they're an agent if you like they're in the chain for that reason because they're very good at, at pulling together the relevant stuff and of course you know many times they they've got the knowledge which an ad agency uh, or indeed a brand doesn't have as to what what would be the right kind of music what what's what would be the best uh, cut to 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 make this give this ad more punch, to make it sound right and look right? You know, the the ad agencies are not in the music business, and the brands are certainly not in the music business, but they do know what they like. So you quite often will, in, will bring in a sync agent to say, look, you know, I'm, I'm looking for this type of feel, this type of sound. What can you find for me? And of course, they might give an example of a uh, I don't know, let's pick on a famous band. Uh, you know, I, I want a Justin Bieber song, and uh, and I want it on my advert for whatever product would, would suit Justin Bieber. Don't make any comments, please. Um, but uh, you know, of course, then it, they find out that Justin Bieber's management want a lot of money for his stuff, and actually, it might be a prohibitive amount of money. And actually, Justin Bieber might be making so much money himself at the moment that he doesn't even want to contemplate his song being used on a on a particular product brand so the sync agent's job is to come in and say well why don't we do this cover version or use this different <coughs> similar piece of music similar song and maybe it's within your budget and and you can't afford to get Madonna or the Rolling Stones or Justin Bieber but I've got this great track by this up-and-coming artist and it would be a perfect solution for you so that's part of what the sync agent does they've got the knowledge of the marketplace the knowledge of what's out there um, and then they also have the knowledge of how to get those rights and sweep in the relevant rights and deliver those to the uh, to the, the relevant um, brand or ad agency but from my perspective it doesn't change anything uh, you still need to go back to the source of the copyright ownership in each case Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, so I have one more question uh, coming from Sharon. She says, um, if you're a writer, composer, performer, publisher, uh, and she pr in parentheses put ASCAP, so you know, any PRO uh, on a song uh, that you want to submit to a music supervisor for sync in a film, uh, where do you register the moral and publishing rights in the UK? Um, well, the answer is that you would uh, you would normally register rights with the PRS, uh, but if you're a member of an affiliated society, so if you're coming from the States, for example, 
I understand you probably would choose between BMI and ASCAP to be the society of choice. And ordinarily, BMI or ASCAP would send over the relevant information to PRS, and then PRS would have it on the UK database. And that's the only place you put it. There's no formal copyright registration in the UK. It's not like you have in Washington where you've got a formal copyright registration process. We don't have that. So the only place that you would um, you would end up with that data existing would probably be on the PRS database. And it should be the job of your collection society, the society that you're assigned to, to make sure that the data is exchanged. And, and that's usually what happens. Excellent. Great, thanks for that. Um, so with those questions answered, uh, we did kind of round out on the hour. Uh, we've gone very in depth uh, in dealing with the types of rights and um, you know, kind of how they relate to the process of sync licensing. Um, I would like to continue with, with uh, you know, maybe a, a, a overall um, summary of, of some of the other stuff that we can dig into. Do you, are you cool with that, Ian? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the rest of the slides you 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 know you're welcome uh, to look through um, at your at your leisure, but uh, it, it, they just go through really the, 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 the we we kind of broke it down to the different ways that you would you would pull right what sort of music you would use for a, a film whether you're using you know you're you're, you're getting a composer to make brand new compositions, brand new recordings for a film, or whether you're licensing in existing music, so you're going to a record company and a publishing company and picking stuff up from them. Um, uh, then we go into a little bit more detail of the performer's rights there, which we talked about earlier, um, and, uh, and the moral rights. And then the only slide I'd like to draw people's attention to is, is um, the, 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 the slide which is headed Synchronization of Mechanical Rights what should you look for in a contract and I think this is important there are two slides on this towards the end of the slide pack I think they're the uh, the third from last slide and the fourth from last slide uh, and that's worth just focusing on for a second because you need to ensure that the license you agree is sufficiently wide in scope so you need to consider here you know if you if it's for a film where's the film going to be shown what formats we release the film, uh, ensure it's a future-proofed agreement because we don't know what's going to happen. You know, who knew about Blinkbox 10 years ago, Netflix, all of these new uh, stuff. And of course, now we're looking at VR uh, coming round the corner. Um, I, you know, I've, I've just heard that the, the Goldman Sachs report, which says that VR in, within 10 years will be bigger than television. That's an important one to... Um, to raise your eyebrows too, so you know VR rights might be different. They, you know, is your sync agreement wide enough to include use in VR? Um, by which I mean, you know, Oculus Rift and others. Um, ensure the license is irrevocable. Make sure it can't be taken away. Got, make sure you've got a right to license uh, the sync, the music, and the adverts, the trailers, the downloads, and all these different things. So look carefully, and this is our job. Really, this is what we do look at this, the, the specific rights in this synchronization agreement and make sure that, 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 that everything is, is, you're getting everything you need for the advert or the film or the TV show that you need and make sure it's long enough. You know, uh, 10 years might be um, okay for an ad, but it certainly wouldn't be okay for a feature film. So you've got to make sure you're picking up the rights for a long enough period of time. Uh, moving on to the second of those slides, what else do you need to look for in the contract? Check you've got moral rights, performers' rights are covered off. Payment, make sure you understand how payment's been calculated. Is it a one-off fee, a license fee, royalties? Are the royalties be paid? Are there different fees coming further down the line for differing formats? All this has to be considered. Uh, the film producer would need to ensure they receive the warranty that the rights holder is entitled to grant this license and that the license is free from any other contractual obligations. Um, and then, you know, quite often you deal with the credit clauses for a film or a movie. You know, you want to make sure that the credits are specifically agreed beforehand. So there may be specific credits, but um, if you're a film producer or you're making the film, you know, you don't want to give away too much here where you get into trouble if there's an accidental failure to give the specified credit. You don't want someone saying, you promised in the sync license you would credit me on everything. Well, hey, you know. Um, there's a film ad trailer came out on CBS and, and I wasn't credited. So you've got to be careful of that. 
um, and then you know look out for uh, favored nations clauses which um, you know, which are quite commonplace in licensing uh, and that's where you inadvertently say I'll give you the, the same deal or as good a deal as anyone else is getting and then you find out that, that someone who's written a tiny piece of music somewhere in the film then comes along and demands the same money as the person who wrote the title track based on the favored nations clauses so watch out for those where are those, so, yeah, those are the key issues. issues. Oh, sorry. Just a real quick question about MFN or yeah. favorite nations clauses. Is that now? Is that something um, that will always be in in the contract, or is that something that can come from from a law? Or where where do those where are those decided? <laughs> well, it, it'll, it'll be specifically in the sync license, which is agreed between the the, the, the music composer and the and the film producer. Obviously, the film producer is going to be very uh, careful not to give a favored nations clause, but sometimes you know uh, a, a music supervisor can miss it and not pick up on it, and you know, and you know the producers raising money for the film, paying the director, the director's busy directing, you know, who's looking at this, who's checking to make sure there's nothing in the sync license which bites them later. Um, and of course, if I was acting for a film producer, I wouldn't give the favored nation clause. You know, I, I just wouldn't, unless you know I had to have a Madonna track as the title track, the opening track to my film, and she demanded it. And you'd say, well, look, we're not going to give anyone a better deal than Madonna's getting, so no problem. The favored nation clause isn't going to hurt us. Um, you know, but you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful to make sure these clauses don't sneak in, because no one is focused on the sync license. Right, great. That makes perfect sense. Okay, well, um, everyone, thanks again. Uh, I apologize for the issue with the slides. It seems like there was a hiccup uh, in our broadcasting software. Uh, we're going to make sure that we uh, include the deck with the recording when we get it up on sync with an H blog dot net. Uh, Ian and Sam, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to spend with us today. I learned a lot. This is definitely a very in depth uh, look at licensing and the law of it. Um, really, really appreciate it. And, um, uh, uh, and you know, I think um, if you look on the last slide, you do have our uh, website address right there at the end. Um, if you click on that website, you'll see all of our contact details somewhere there, Sam and myself. So if you've got any questions, anything comes up, you know, um, do feel free to email and we'll, we'll try and get back to you and, and give you some, some views on it. That's, uh, that's really great. And we'll include that, of course, uh, in the blog post as well. Uh, thanks again, guys. I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, this has been Sync Stories. Uh, I'm Mike from Sync Tank, uh, here with Ian and Sam from New Media Law. Uh, just a quick announcement, um, and you know I always do this. Uh, you guys can check us out on most social media platforms uh, except for Instagram. I don't think you want to see that. Uh, at Sync Tank, that's Sync with an H. Uh, you can follow uh, the Sync Story series as well. Get some really great articles from uh, our producer, Emma Griffiths, at syncblog.net.